How are you? Greetings from afar. I hope you're doing great. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are joining us from. Welcome to today's program. On behalf of Badminton Pan America, we welcome you to our Coach Corner program, Season 3. My name is Adrián Gómez, and I am pleased to be your moderator and join, I'm joining you from San Jose in Costa Rica. Today we have the pleasure of having one of the most prominent coaches in badminton in Pan America. I'm talking about Coach Raju Rai from the United States, who will talk about his experience in junior athletes. This interesting topic is Bridging the Gap, the Evolution of a Junior Player. Before leaving you with the speaker, I'd like to summarize a little bit about our guest's career in badminton. As an athlete, Raju represented the United States in the Olympic Games 2008 in men's singles. In addition, he was 37 in the world ranking in men's singles. Also, he's a seven-time U.S. national champion. As a coach, Raju is a USA Badminton High Performance Level 3 coach. He was the Team USA assistant coach for the 2019 Pan Am Games, which was in the city of Lima, And he's currently the head coach for multiple training academies that have produced over 50 junior national champions. Without further ado, let's welcome Coach Raju Ray. Good afternoon, Raju. Welcome to our program. Thank you for sharing with our audience and welcoming us from your home in California. Welcome. Gracias por recibirme, Adrián. Lo aprecio. Uh, well, first of all, I definitely wanted to give a warm thank you to um, everyone from Badminton Pan America, uh, for my sponsor, Yonex, and for all the attendees today uh, attending the webinar. Uh, I, I feel very honored to be uh, representing, you know, USA Badminton, um, fellow coaches and players. Uh, the topic I chose today was Bridging the Gap, the Evolution of a Junior Player. And um, the reason being is uh, it holds a, a special place in my heart as um, I've gone through this process, one, as an athlete and as a coach. And uh, having, uh, you know, I've been very blessed to have great coaches, great teammates, and great players to, to learn from. And um, I hope, you know, some of these best practices that I share with you today could be um, very useful for you as well. <clears throat> When I, when I reflect on this, sports plays a, a very important role in our life. Um, sports teaches us a lot of life lessons, not only how to play the, the sport of badminton, but it also teaches us who we are, um, what is our personality, what we are capable of, what areas we need to improve. And um, that's why I think this is just, it's a very important um, responsibility that is put upon coaches to educate and um, to raise their players into, um, you know, their, their best potential. So with that being said, I'd, I'd like to move here into, um, this is a basic overview of different age categories that um, the athletes go through. And it, it's basically like a progression cycle. Um, we're, we're here not to uh, perfect it, it's just we're looking for uh, constant improvement and progress. And an analogy that I like to um, educate parents or players is on when a kid graduates from elementary school and moves on to a middle school, you know, the material that they would be studying, how they're tested, um, how they must train themselves, how they uh, must prepare will be uh, very different from the next stage. So a lot of times 
parents and players tend to get caught up on, hey, I've done X, Y, and Z, and it's gotten me this far. I'm just gonna continue to do this, and then that will help me um, achieve the same results at the next level. And not to say that that does not work, but it's not always uh, the case for that. So this is um, an overview of what we will cover today, and I will dive in um, to each cate category a bit more on each of the slides. So to start first with uh, an under seven age group, I wanted to you know, go back in time and show you guys a few photos here on the um, bottom part of the slide, if you can see here. This is a picture from 1994 when I won my first uh, US junior national title. And here is a photo from, um, I believe this is in 1996 um, in Atlanta, right after the uh, Olympics where uh, I had won another junior national title. But I chose these photos just as um, a time to reflect as, you know, for, for me, the most important um, aspect for someone young getting started in badminton is obviously they have to have a love for the game. And it's important here to, you know, make things casual, make it fun, let them get interested in the sports. There shouldn't be too high of expectations. It's just purely enjoyment of the game because when that runs out, you know, the motivation to, to work hard, to want to progress, to, to um, take their um, talents to, to different heights and different levels. Um, without that love for the game, it, it would be very challenging. And also in this um, age category, it's a chance for you to teach them basic fundamentals, such as how do they hold the racket, um, how to keep score, what are the, the boundary lines of the court, um, different hand-eye coordination. It's just a very simple, basic introduction to badminton. Try to teach them healthy, good habits um, so that they can um, keep this with them throughout their career. Things like how do they warm up before they have a training session or before they play? How do they cool down? Um, these are just some of the basic fundamentals that uh, would be very important to teach them at such a young age. Also, after you have gone through these uh, fundamental trainings, the goal here is to get them to be able to start a rally. So in these basic fundamentals, they have to learn how to bounce a birdie, how to serve. And the goal here is to get them to be able to start a rally, whether they're playing with their parents, they're playing with their teammates or friends, whoever it may be, but just getting that simple back and forth hitting it. The faster that we can get there, it brings brings a lot of joy, you know, to these young players to know that, hey, I can, I can start hitting with my friends, I can start enjoying the sport. Um, and that's kind of that, uh, that's kind of their phase here in the, um, the U7 age group. And finally, moving to internal games, these internal games, whether it's, um, you know, they're at a community center, or they're at their local club, these games can be anywhere from with their friends or um, their teammates, but you can also structure some, you know, some a small tournament atmosphere for them where it's not too daunting, where they feel lots of pressure, or that they're only focused on winning. Again, you know, the 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 point we're trying to emphasize here is just this love for this game and the introduction to you know how do they keep score? What is a what does a real game look like? Just giving them a little sample of. Um, what they have to taste, uh, you know, for the sport. <clears throat> for the next category, um, U9 and U11 age groups, it tends to get a little more um, serious. So I'm gonna go a little more down the competition route. And what that means is from here, this is kind of the, um, the foundation to where you have to plant that seed in the player and, give them that overall view of, hey, you know, if this is something that you love and you want to take seriously, here are the, the steps that we can help um, you progress to because you do have a potential to be great at this sport, to be a champion, whether it's in your region, in your country, uh, or, you know, hopefully a world champion someday. So the first being with footwork. 
Now to, to dive in with footwork, there's, there's so many components. This is kind of just basic level of footworks. Um, getting the players to understand that there should be a hop step, which is a ready step when um, someone hits the shuttle to them. Um, not that the player is just standing still. This is a, a, a way to get them ready, to stay alert, to have their muscles engaged so that they can cover the court. At this age, they are quite young, quite small. You know, their muscles are still developing. It's, and it's a really um, important time as they're like a, a they're, they're a blank slate. So whatever we can show them in these cases, you know, it would be, it would be nice um, because they can remember these uh, correct techniques and these correct footworks. So having that hop step, how to do a um, scissor kick, which is like an advanced, um, you move your, your racket foot forward when you're hitting the shuttle and it's a way to, to hit, the, hit the bird around the court without um, having to stop and pause before aiming and hitting the shuttle. So just having some of those general uh, footworks, having your racket foot in front when you hit in the front court, um, being able to understand when the player should be sliding on the court versus running. So to touch a little bit more on that, um, when a player has an anticipation or they think they know where the, the shuttle will be going, you know, coaches will usually advise them, hey, you, you can use that running technique because it's a lot faster to, to move to the, next, uh, uh, to the next shot. Whereas if there's some uncertainty of where your opponent will be hitting the bird or you're not sure what to anticipate, you will usually slide to the center of the court and use that hop. And then you would react to wherever your opponent is hitting the shuttle. So that's kind of just a little brief introduction on the uh, footwork component. Moving on to the technical skills, these are some of the basic shots. And this kind of ties in here with um, consistency is teaching the kids how to hit uh, clean and um, great contact on their clears, drops, smashes, how to control the shuttle straight and cross court. Um, the kids often have a hard time developing uh, a lot of power at this age. So it's important to get that repetition in there and get the clean hitting. Uh, badminton is not necessarily a sport that requires a lot of power and muscle. It's a lot of timing and uh, how clean the contact can be on the racket. And also when I, when I talk about technical skills here um, at this age group, if the kid is able to learn some type of deception they are able to score um, quite a bit of easy points um, because again, it's not easy for them to cover the court based on their size and um, how much muscle that they have in their body. So teaching them these technical skills can help build a lot of confidence in themselves because they're noticing, hey, I'm scoring a lot of scoring a lot of points. Um, you know, I'm winning these matches based on. Um, these key, what we like to call like skills or superpowers, they have these um, key shots that, you know, their opponent can't see. So just going through this consistent repetition and building those techno technical skills is really important at this age group. And this is usually where we would um, introduce them to some smaller competitions um, so that they can get uh, they can get their feet wet. They can understand, you know, what, what a tournament looks like. How do they prepare for games? Um, what the draw looks like, how they can uh, perform under pressure. Um, also learning lessons from winning and losing. Um, this is also a great time for the coach to introduce coaching outside of training. <clears throat> and I'll touch a little bit on that later in the presentation, but in, in competition coaching versus um, in training coaching is, is quite different. And um, a lot of times when players are first introduced to tournaments, they're very ner nervous and there's a lot of pressure and they're not even able to retain the information that the coach is providing. So it's a great learning atmosphere to, um, 
to put them in these uh, smaller tournaments. And then, you know, you can take what the player learns from here and you can go back and implement that in training. And that's a really um, useful tool to, to highlight, you know, what areas we need to improve on and, and where we're, we're going strong in. So that's a, that's what I think is very important for these um, early stages uh, for U9 and U11. And as they graduate from these age groups, this is where um, things start to get a lot more uh, strenuous or rigorous in the training. <clears throat> when I'm speaking about physical fitness, this is where our goal here is to introduce um, different ways to build their physical. They can be on court with footwork uh, um, or things like jump rope, and they can be also off court where we use exercises like agility. Um, we will use plyometrics. We will use uh, running on the track. Different ways that we can um, build their body stronger without putting so much strain on it. Because at the goal, the goal here is they're very young, they're still developing, and we don't want to um, put so much strain and pressure on the body that would create injuries. And uh, it's, it's really important here to have a well-rounded physical program so that we are targeting different areas of their body and their game to uh, make them very well-rounded. <clears throat> and when I'm when I move along here to some of the advanced technical skills, here is here's where we can start introducing teaching how the um, teaching the players how to hold the shuttle, uh, have fake shots, different kind of slices, net spins, um, how to delay. There's a lot of uh, deception that comes in to this phase of their um, development. And it's really important here because if they lack these technical skills, as they progress, you know, their game will be uh, very easy to read, very simple. Uh, opponents will be able to understand um, what shot they're hitting, when they're hitting it, why they're hitting it. And this is a, a key phase here for, for really your, your goal is to give them as many options from each corner of the court so that they can play different skills, different shots, and um, they can also hide this uh, from their opponents. And this also ties into their drills and strategy. So regarding drills and strategy, at, at this stage, we use a lot of pattern drills. And um, there's a few reasons why we use the pattern drills. One is when we have a pattern drill, it's easy for um, the players to catch on to what shots they're hitting. It's easy for them to sustain a rally because they know what shot they're supposed to hit. They know where they're hitting it. The person that they're doing the drill with also knows that information. So it's a little bit easier for them to continue on the drill uh, and the rally. And another reason why pattern drills are so effective is it's teaching the athletes to learn how to think and play at the same time. Now, if we just happen to do random drills, you know, there's just a lot of times kids will just be focused on winning, winning the rally, winning the point or getting the drill over with. And there's not a lot of active learning going on. <clears throat> but as they do a pattern drill, they're constantly ha having to remember what shot they're supposed to hit and where it's supposed to go and what's happening next. And subconsciously, we're training them how to anticipate, how to think um, of what's going to happen before it happens. And I think that's a really key um, component here in developing that mental aspect of the game because you know, the, the physical component will, will only take you so far. And that's kind of an, this is kind of an element where, you know, these pattern drills can introduce, you know, how to use their mind when they're, when they're playing the game. <clears throat> and also just implementing different strategy uh, components within the training. Let's say that you have a player that, you know, they may have grown, um, grown taller or stronger than uh, their peers in this age group. Typically that player may be a more offensive minded player. They like to attack um, with smashes or clears. You can design drills around, you know, building their offense and continually, continuing to develop that. 
or you may have a player that is uh, smaller and lacks power, they may be more of a consistent player where they have a defensive um, and counter uh, style. This is a really um, good time to introduce and start talking about um, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of the player individually, and you can start to design a program around them that will, um, you know, help build their strengths and help them understand, okay, this is how I should play. This is why I'm training in this method. And then when it comes to a tournament time, when you give a strategy during the competition, you can refer back to, hey, do you understand why we did this drill? This is a time where you need to implement this strategy. And that way it's a little bit easier for the, the players or the athletes to understand what the coach is trying to guide them and trying to, um, to educate them during uh, the tournament. <clears throat> this is also the time where, um, you know, they can comp compete in uh, uh, their junior national championships within their country, as well as there are uh, junior Pan Am tournaments within the region, as well as the junior Pan Am championships. Um, each federation, as well as uh, Badminton Pan Am, has done a great job growing that uh, junior Pan Am championships. I know when I was uh, competing, it was maybe a handful of countries and a handful of players. And now, the, you know, year after year, there's a record amount of attendance. I mean, the amount of skills and um, just the talent that we see coming up in our region has uh, been phenomenal. And I, I think that credit goes not only to the federations, but also, you know, to the coaches, the technical officials who have created this um, community and this environment for, for the young players to succeed. Um, so big kudos to, um, to the Pan Am region for that. And lastly, moving forward here um, for these under 17 and under 19 categories, I think here is really probably the biggest change that the junior players will face. Um, they, they now have this power and speed that they have gotten um, from multi-shuttle training, from their physical conditioning. And <clears throat> a lot of times prior to this uh, age group, you know, a lot of the game is just around who can play the fastest and it's a lot of focus is on winning and the players don't really understand why they're winning. There's a lot of hard work being a lot of effort and hard work being put on the court and there's not a lot of time being spent off the court. And I think this is a, a great place to introduce that. This is where I like to use that quote, bridging the gap is how do we take our athletes from this position and get them ready to compete on the professional level. And the first being is strength training. Um, I think the most important aspect here is injury prevention. A lot of times at this age category, they are training twice a day, six days a week, somewhere in the range between 15 to 25 hours a week. And, you know, their body is taking a toll. Um, badminton is a very strenuous sport and it's important that <clears throat> we train the muscles of the key muscle groups of their body to prevent these injuries. And also so that they can recover faster um, in between each training sessions. So these strength trainings can be um, with a personal trainer introducing um, whether it be free weights or uh, weights with machines. You want them here to learn the uh, proper technique from a certified uh, trainer, or they could also be, um, resistance bands, um, which would also be uh, less impact. Um, it's also a little more um, easier for the, the players to learn how to use the resistance bands versus, you know, having heavy amount of weights on their body and, you know, you're being worried that they would injure themselves. So I think this is a key component where we can introduce uh, strength training. And what another area where that strength training will help is just improving that overall explosiveness on the court. If your muscles are not as strong, um, typically the players will be running around the court. And the downside to that is uh, one, it's easy for them to get out of position. And you know, they may they may have gotten that first initial shot, 
but they would be playing catch up uh, for the remainder of the rally. And also when you're running, your breathing tends to get really hard, uh, like really heavy. And uh, <clears throat> when it comes to that point, you know, it's, it's very difficult for you to think straight. It's difficult for you to recover for the next rally. And um, that fatigue kicks in. Whereas if you build this strong foundation through your strength training, when you're moving from the court, it's more of explosive movements. It's more um, gliding or walking and you, you can use less steps. So <clears throat> having that strong um, foundation within your muscles, it will like the first phase that you will feel when you get tired is your muscles will start burning and you'll start to feel tired there. But you know internally that, you know, your breathing has not gotten so hard and you know there's, an, there's another gear that you can push to. There's another level of your fitness. And when those muscles fatigue, you could do any kind of stretching to um, remove some of that lactic acid. Or if not, you could alter, you know, the way you're playing or shift your footwork to be more of a running style so that you can last a bit longer before um, you start breathing heavily. So that's where um, I think strength training can be huge um, in this age category. Another uh, area here is shot quality. Now, when, when players are transitioning from this phase, they're either competing in um, some junior international tournaments or now they're transitioning to national tournaments within their country if they're playing against older players <clears throat> who have a lot of experience, their shot quality is, is, is very good. They understand, you know, what shots to use at different times during the game. They understand um, the placement of those shots. They also understand, um, you know, how much risk to take. A lot of times young players are, are they're very hungry and thirsty to get that quick point. And that leads to a lot of um, unforced errors, getting out of position. And, you know, the, the older professional players, they understand as, as long as I'm hitting quality shots, there will be a point in the rally where I will um, get an advantage or I'll get a weak return or a weak reply. And that will be a chance for me to score. And the players here really have to understand how important shot quality becomes because um, at this stage, everybody's body um, and height and strength is, is quite uh, similar amongst your, um, your competitors. And, you know, these days everybody's getting so, so great at everything, you know, they can dive and return shuttles and they can be back on the court in, in a split of a second. So that shot quality will be the key to um, getting an advantage as well as uh, scoring the point once you get that advantage. And then that shot quality kind of ties in here with some of um, game sparring. So when I'm talking about game sparring, it's having different situational games. Um, for example, you may have athletes that when they start their match, they tend to uh, start very slow, get behind, lose confidence. They're getting a hole, getting themselves in a hole. And then after that point, it's a, it's a bit challenging to uh, climb out of that hole. So an exercise that I would um, create for them would be, okay, let's play, um, let's play a bunch of matches. Let's say the first to win 10 matches is the winner. And we're just going to play this game from zero to 11 points. And we're designing this game sparring so that they're just working on how can they improve their start of the game. After they, whoever won, after they got to 11, they would go back and start over at zero. And this is just kind of a, an example for how they can um, use game sparring uh, to improve, like to introduce different strategies or improve different um, parts of how they're playing the game. This is also a time where um, they get a chance to play against older players who they have a lot of different playing styles. Um, they may have different um, weapons that they use and uh, older players have a little more maturity, more experience. And it's a way to, to get them to think a lot more on the court and how to make adjustments on the fly. Because in the pre previous age categories, you know, the game could be a little more simple, like, okay, hit harder, play faster, or 
use this one technical skill and you can score the point or, you know, pick on their backhand and you can get an easy point. Whereas in this stage, I mean, most of the players are very well-rounded, very capable of hitting any shot from any corner of the court. It's really important here that they understand how to get that advantage within the rally and how to um, improve other elements of their game. So that's basic. That's just a basic overview of how um, through each age group, the players have to continue to um, evolve their game, their training program and, and continue to progress and not get so stuck on, um, hey, this is what worked before. It's always a continuous progress. You, you're always trying to improve, evolve. And um, <clears throat> these are kind of some of those key areas that um, it's very important for the coach to educate the player and the parents so that they understand the roadmap that we're on. So I'll pass this off to um, Adrian for a short break. Uh, so just continuing on here, <clears throat> this is a very uh, important slide to review. There's a lot of uh, key details. The goal, the goal to build a successful athlete or successful player is to, to make sure that they have this healthy body, mind, and spirit. And I'll start first with uh, building confidence. And there's so many ways to improve the confidence within our athletes. I believe that one of the first ways is building that community, that family within your team so that, so that they feel this is a safe space. They can be themselves. It's okay um, if things are not done well. They can learn from one another. But just having that nurturing environment building that sense of community is, is a really key aspect here in uh, building their confidence. And how a player acts or how their personality is off the court, the goal here is to get that personality for them on the court. A lot of times um, we may be shy or we may not be comfortable in our own skin. I definitely had some of those challenges as an athlete, but it's important for us to highlight, you know, what are their strengths within their personality? Wow, this person is a, is a, a very aggressive person. Um, they have an aggressive personality. Now you know that this can translate onto the court when they're playing, they must be a very aggressive person. They're not maybe necessarily so patient. So I think really highlighting those key aspects of their personality and showing them like, hey, this is what you're really good at. This is what makes you special. And this is what you need to bring onto the court. I think that's a really um, key aspect on how to build their confidence. Also, just making sure that they understand um, the right attitude and mindset when they step on the court. It's um, what I like to refer to as uh, the triple E's is anything that you do, you should have an abundance of energy, eagerness, and excitement. So when they're stepping on the court, if they don't have that right mindset, it's important to pull them aside, have that um, constant communication, and, and just let them reflect on how they can be better. Because um, instilling that right attitude and mindset is really what's going to take them um, farther. And the last, I would say, when it comes to building confidence is um, the use of affirmations. And affirmations are basically positive statements that um, you, you want to happen or that you believe will happen. <clears throat> a lot of times um, players will have a lot of negative thoughts in their mind and it's, we can alter how we say things. Like instead of me saying, oh, uh, my backhand sucks, I could say um, I'm practicing working on my backhand. So having these players alter their internal thoughts and what they're also saying um, aloud is really important to, to building that positive, uh, positive mindset and that confidence within themselves. And I'll move here on to um, empowering your player. This is something that I know that coaches and parents struggle with, as well as uh, myself in the earlier stages of my coaching career. A lot of times, the parent and the coach wants to be in control of what the athlete is going to do. 
And yes, in the short term, we may be able to get the result that we wanted. We may be able to get that victory in that tournament um, or that some kind of win in a in some sort of game. But the goal here is instead of telling them what to do, I think it's an important stage that we guide them on what needs to be done. <clears throat> so an example of this would be, um, let's say that a, a player needed to um, improve their physical conditioning, um, their technical skills and all of that is great. And now they've gotten to this high level, but they're not able to score points uh, to a certain degree in the rally. And then they lose those points because their physical is down instead of kind of punishing them or designing a training program where it's just any physical that the coach or parent wants to do. A lot of times the player will lack that motivation. What I like to do in those moments is to give the player a, a menu of choices. So you could give them five choices of physical so that they can choose the ones that kind of um, enjoy, they enjoy more. And I mean, at the end of the day, the coach and the parent is designing those, that menu of items. So any of those items they do choose will benefit them anyway. And then by giving them that choice to make that decision, they also feel that they um, have some entitlement and then they, they, they would hold themselves accountable as well instead of you know, the coach and the parent really trying to hound in on, hey, you didn't do your footwork or you need to go do your jump rope. How come you didn't go running outside? And then it just falls into this cycle where, you know, their authoritative figures in their life are just constantly, you know, putting them down with negative thoughts or they're, they have this feeling of, you know, they're not doing enough or they're not being successful. So I think it's, it's important how <clears throat> you can have that open dialogue and open communication with your players so that, you know, it's important that they fear, they feel heard, seen, and loved while um, you're going through this whole uh, journey. So I think that's a really important uh, piece to the puzzle. And now to touch a bit on uh, <clears throat> coaching when it comes to training and uh, versus in a tournament. I touched on it briefly, but I wanted to go uh, a little more in depth on that. Um, <clears throat> just going back to when it comes to coaching and training, you're able to um, be able to stop players um, within a drill. Um, you're also able to, before training, you're able to lay out a program and lay out the purpose of the program. It's, it's, a, it's a very important time here to, to highlight, okay, today's focus of the training is X, Y, and Z, and this is why we are focusing on them. And then after that drill has finished, it's a great moment to bring in your players and give them a review of the drill. Here is what we've done well. Here is where we can be better. And, and the reason why I say here is where we can be better is, it's a positive way of highlighting what areas we didn't do so well. So instead of saying, we didn't do this well, we didn't do that well, the players are only going to remember that part. Usually they, it's hard for them to remember, oh, I did one thing great, but I did five things wrong. Uh, you know, our, um, our, our nature is to remember the five things that we did wrong and not the one thing that we did right. So altering how we give that you know, coaching advice back to the players, I think is really important. And having that review session afterwards, just um, reiterates what we were focused on and where we can be better. <clears throat> and then also at the end of uh, the training session, I like to have a, um, a visualization or a reflection time. It could be anywhere from five to 10 minutes. And this is where you get your players to sit down, they close their eyes, and it's a time for them where they can visualize what they did better and what they could have done better in the training, visualize maybe <clears throat> a game that they're going to be um, a game or a tournament that they will be competing in the future. Or, you know, it could just be a time where they're just reflecting on um, themselves on how they want to improve or a time to uh, release, release the stress um, from the training session. 
So I think a lot of times if we just move into a training session and move out of it, the lessons learned, they kind of get pushed to the side and it just becomes, uh, you know, another, just another moment in the day, another thing to get through instead of it being like a purple purposeful interaction. So that's where I really like to, um, make sure that I have a, a really, uh, emphasis on purposeful coaching within training. <clears throat> and then when it comes to coaching in the tournament, it's important to understand your player and how they like to be coached. Certain players um, do not respond well to uh, criticism during games. Certain players may not like a coach that talks a lot uh, within the within the match. <clears throat> they may only want you to um, give them feedback at the intervals. They may also want very simple feedback, whereas certain athletes would like you to go uh, really in depth and detail on what strategy to use or where to attack the opponent. <clears throat> so it's really important to understand what your player likes in the, how they like to be coached uh, in the tournament. And also <clears throat> something that I've learned uh, while coaching in the tournament is when you have an athlete competing against an opponent, there are multiple ways to beat them. And the coach usually will point out the easiest way for you to beat the opponent. And there's often times where the player does not feel comfortable with that strategy. And rather than saying, like forcing them, forcing that strategy on them, they where they're gonna be uncomfortable, they're not gonna believe in it, you know, they're not gonna perform well. It's important, you know, if they have a, an, a different strategy that they want to use, you can say like, you know, I don't think that this is the easiest way to win, but you can win this way. It just may require more effort or more energy, or you're really going to have to push yourself to overcome, you know, playing this style. So that, that way you're kind of building that sense of trust. Like uh, they know that you're hearing them and that you know that they can win in different ways. It just requires a different kind of uh, mindset or approach. Like maybe it's more physical or maybe it's more of a, a mental or strategical way to, to win the tournament. So those are um, different ways that I use um, to kind of help the players perform better in tournaments <clears throat> and how to, how to get them to overcome uh, playing under pressure those, those come, you know, back from building your confidence with your affirmations that goes to um, taking the lessons that you learn from the tournament and implementing those directly in uh, your training. Like if the player is not performing under well, if the player is not performing well under pressure, you can set up a, a, a like a training session where, okay, let's start the game at 20 all and let's have them play for 30 minutes and you just tally up how many wins and losses they have. And this is a great, um, a great tool, you know, to get the players used to, Oh, I've been playing all these games in practice at 20 all. Now, when they step into a tournament, they feel comfortable in that environment. Like a lot of times why they feel pressure in a tournament is they're in a, um, a circumstance or in a situation that they haven't seen before and they don't know how to deal with it. And there's a lot of panic or, they're not sure how to control their emotions in that state. And if they fail in that moment, that's okay. That's where you can take those lessons, you implement it in your training. And then the next competition that you come to, they will be more ready for that situation. So this is a really big slide here, touching on you know really key aspects of how to get your players to perform their best, whether it's in training, whether it's in coaching, whether it's on the court or off the court, it's all related. <clears throat> and I think just building that healthy body, mind, and spirit is, is really crucial. And lastly, just moving on to the, to the last slide here, um, Badminton Pan Am gave me an opportunity to share um, uh, the foundation that I have been a part of <clears throat> we have a great team um, that created this first ever foundation. Um, our mission is to establish badminton scholarships here for American athletes 
who are pursuing a college education and a career in badminton at the professional and Olympic level. <clears throat> One of the um, challenges that we face in America badminton is that we lose a lot of talented athletes um, when they graduate high school. And that is because they, it's at this stage, it's very difficult to make a living being a professional badminton player. And they often have to give up their badminton career to pursue their education or vice versa. They wanna pursue badminton and they put their education on hold. Whereas in some of uh, different other countries or in mainstream sports, they have an opportunity to do both. And we feel that it's very important for them to do both. You know, this time or this phase of their life when they're 18, it, it can be very challenging to make that big of a decision. Um, going to school not only will give you the knowledge and the education, uh, the maturity to move forward, but it's also a time for you to network with a new group of people who you know will be your your colleagues or your um your, your working professionals during that phase of your life and that that knowledge that they'll gain from their education will translate to them on the court you know to be able to perform smarter to be you know open-minded to to new uh, different ways of training or competing <clears throat> so the first ever foundation, what we have done is, you know, we, we've reached out to the community. They have been gracious to um, help support this cause and help provide a yearly, it's a four year scholarship that is distributed yearly for any um, student that wants to pursue a full-time education while being, while transitioning into a professional badminton career. So it's super exciting. We, we launched this foundation this year. Esther Shi here on the left, as well as William were our first recipients for the scholarship this year. So we're super honored to have them as our ambassadors. We're also grateful to um, Yonex to support this great cause. Um, we look forward to taking um, the foundation to um, higher limits and hopefully offer, you know, more scholarships, whether it be for US athletes on, only or through the Pan Am region. But I wanted to share a little bit about that today with you guys as, um, you know, when I, when I talk about community, I think um, we have an amazing badminton community in this Pan Am region. And just to have a lot of technical officials, coaches, athletes, federations to, um, to provide resources for these players to pursue their dreams, I think you know, that's the key for us to, uh, to, to continue having success and hopefully to uh, winning more medals on the uh, world and international level. So I thank you all for um, the time for allowing me to speak to you today. And uh, I'll pass that on over to Adrian. Thank you, Reju. So now we move on to our to the Q&A. But first, I would like to tell you that I am all in favor for these type of initiatives, which will help us to have uh, badminton as a way of living. And we have to start creating new uh, athletes and help these new generations in their education so they don't uh, leave badminton aside. Raju, I have two different types of questions. One in regards to athletes and other questions in regards to you. So I'm going to start with the questions from the about the athletes. So what advice would you give on the best way of combining education with badminton? Because sometimes we notice that it's difficult for athletes at an early stage to do both and that they are both implicit. Yeah, a lot of times I would say the, the stigma or the reputation around um, trying to go to school and uh, balance your training a lot of times that the, the athlete will feel overwhelmed, but I think that, I, I believe that they complement one another. Um, it's important to keep an active mind. And 
when you're in school, you learn different um, key aspects such as like organization, how to prioritize, how to plan things, uh, your concentration, how to focus, how to remember. I think all of these key aspects translate back to your training because when you're on court, you need to remember five, six, seven rallies ago, what happened and why they did this strategy against you. Or, you know, when you're on the court, you must be very focused on what's going on. So you know how to, um, uh, what is the word? Like how to make an adjustment when it's necessary or organizing your training program outside of what your coach has made so that you have small areas that you want to improve on. On. So I, I definitely see how um, the education can go hand in hand with their training. And as we see, there's many other top sports and top athletes where, you know, they, they're, they're given scholarships to go and compete at the highest level. And they're able to do that in the Olympics. And I think uh, it's no different for badminton as well. Right. And there is a quote that I usually say. Coaches are educators. So if it's possible, we have to keep our kids in school so, and so they can do both at the same time. Do you think it's important to involve uh, kids in their clubs? I'm talking about junior players so they can help in club activities in order to help other Uh, uh, junior athletes so they can also improve their level and also to involve them in other badminton activities? 100%. I think that's really important. Um, as, as our young athletes grow up and mature and become, um, you know, the ambassadors of our region or our country, these are the people that the young players look up to. And I think this is um, kind of the advantage for those countries who do have national teams is you have a, um, this older age group of players or athletes that the young ones can look up to and having them come back to where they started or having them visit different regions of the country or different clubs could inspire that next young champion. It could teach them lessons And then at the end of the day, it's a way to give back. It's a way to promote the sport. And um, I mean, just like, for example, this, the webinars that you guys have been doing, I mean, it's great to have coaches, athletes, technical officials, um, staff, they're all coming back to share the knowledge and the resources. And I think that's the advantage of, you know, building that type of community. Okay. What do you think about... Uh, training habits and responsibilities in order to achieve ob their objectives since junior categories? Should the coach in, uh, be aligned with the parents? What's your experience in here? Yeah, I definitely believe that it has to be a united front. Um, the game has changed a lot from when I was a junior player till now. Now the parents are a lot more involved and a lot of times that could get a um, negative connotation, but parents get involved because they care. They're invested in their, their kids' success and to have that united front to be on the same page with the parent is a key so that we are teaching the, we are teaching or we are relaying the same amount of information to the athlete so that they're not confused. Hey, my coach is telling me one thing, but my parent is telling me another. So I think just have what I said, what I said earlier was just keeping that open dialogue um, so that they feel comfortable. They know the plan. They know what's going on. A lot of times parents will tend to um, react when they don't know what is the plan. And I think that's, that just reflects a bit back onto the player and the coach that If we are a bit more transparent, more organized, better communication, we can all be on that same path to success. Very well, then I have a question from one of the coaches. I suppose you've always uh, gone through these generational change and he's asking, 
how important do you think that I, the use of IT and communication techniques is, is important? How, how important do you think they are in junior athletes? Because currently they are really involved in these communication techniques and IT means. I definitely think it can help um, with more innovative ways to train. And I think we have seen that as um, players are able to last longer before I know they were retiring in their mid twenties. And now you see, you know, some of the top players in the world, they're, they're in their mid thirties and they're still competing. So I think just having more innovative ways to use technology to train can also um, increase the longevity of their career, prevent injuries, make training uh, more engaging. Um, also, it's easier to, if you were to track statistics or um, showcase, you know, different um, speeds of how you're hitting the shuttle. Um, I know some coaches track, you know, their heart rate of the players to monitor you know, how hard did they push during the training session? And you can monitor that through different training sessions. So I do see uh, um, that being very uh, valuable to provide um, that information. So it's not so um, subjective. You actually have uh, the proper metrics to prove, um, you know, why this is, why this is happening or why this is not happening. So I think that's uh, very, very important for the, uh, the future of the game. Perfect. Well, the last question before we finish, according to your experience, you've been an athlete and now you're a coach and you've competed in the Olympic cycle. Where do you think that the best players are in junior uh, categories, in uh, high performance, where? Oh, that's a tough question. You know, I have to choose my own country, right? That's not a fair question. <laughs> um, but I think it's more diverse now throughout the world. I, you definitely see um, how well Japan has been doing uh, the past few years. Europe is coming strong. Um, China China has always dominated. India has also developed a lot of great, great young talent. But even in our own region, you now see Michelle Lee doing big things. She's won a, a, an Olympic medal. She's won the Commonwealth Games. So, you know, I'm a little biased. I will choose the Pan Am region just because I want to see them do well. And there's so much talent. It's just, um, I think our time is is on the way. And hopefully, you know, we can make some history uh, for the 2028 LA Games. Raju, we've run out of time. I don't know if you want to uh, give a last uh, message to the coaches and PE teachers who are joining us today in this webinar. Yeah, would love to. Uh, first of all, just thanks again for your time. Uh, a big thank you to Badminton Pan America for the opportunity to share um, the experience that I have. Thank you to uh, Yonex as my sponsor. If you guys had any questions, you can reach me um, via email. My email address is rajurai23 at gmail.com. I would love to connect with you offline and see um, if I can help support you in any way. And thanks again. Thank you very much, Raju. And thank you for sharing such interesting information. As always, it's very enriching to discuss uh, these topics with people like you who actually let us know a little, a little bit about what you are doing in your country. And to you, our audience, please help us improve the content quality of our webinar by anonymously answering the poll. to our badminton family. Get your smartphones ready to capture the QR code. We invite you to the next session entitled Anticipation in Badminton, Influencing Factors and Approaches to Training. This talk will be given next Tuesday, November 17th at 3 p.m. 
Lima time. When we will have the pleasure of having the presentation from David Bradbent from the United Kingdom. We encourage you to propose topics you are interested in. Write them down in the chat box. We, I, oh, I would also like to invite you to check out Badminton Panam's YouTube channel, where you will be able to watch today's conference as well as others we've had in the past. On behalf of Badminton Panam, we thank you for joining us. And we hope you like this session. Take care and see you soon. Take care. See you next time. Thank you.